This is going to be Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to look at the subject of neither give place to the devil. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27 says, neither give place to the devil. Uh, number one, neither give place to the devil in your vocation. Ephesians 4 1 says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So neither give place to the devil in your vocation, that is your calling, occupation, your trade, whatever. If you're born again, then your real calling isn't what you do 40 hours a week. Your real calling is to preach the gospel, give out the gospel some way. Many of you probably have other callings that pertain to the Lord, but every person has a calling, and that is to give the gospel, every saved person. And 2 Timothy 1.9 says, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling. If you're saved, then you're called. Uh, whether or not you do what you're supposed to do, you're still called. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. 1 Thessalonians 2, 12, That you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. So you're called, but you're also called to do something. And if you don't want to give place to the devil in your vocation, then don't walk according to the course of this world. Walk the opposite direction of the world. That most of the time, whatever the world is doing isn't what God wants you to do. But let's look at the word walk in the Bible and see how we can make, make our walk better. Colossians 1.10 says that you might walk worthy of the Lord into all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Christians need to maintain good works and increase in the knowledge of God. How do you do this? By reading about him in his book and spending time with him in prayer. And this will help you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. If a pastor or teacher isn't increasing in the knowledge of God, then he is probably giving place to the devil somewhere. Maybe his ministry involves the new versions of the Bible, which destroy the character of Jesus Christ, and he can increase in the knowledge of God and walk worthy using a perversion of Scripture that lies about Jesus Christ. Ephesians four eleven through 13 says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Jesus Christ gives evangelists, pastors, and teachers to the body of Christ to perfect the saints and to edify them. And if they don't walk worthy in their vocation, they give place to the devil and they can damage other Christians. 1 Timothy 3, 6 says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Maybe they damage others through false doctrine, through bad behavior, they can't keep their hands and eyes off another man's wife. They spend all their time doing other things besides studying. Even though the Bible says to be apt to teach. And if you don't know the word, the word of God, then you'll be ignorant of Satan's devices and he can creep right in on you. Ephesians 4.14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The ones being tossed to and fro are being done this way by men who are giving place to the devil. And there are men who are King James only one week, then they bash the King James Bible the next week and pick up an ESV. They believe that we have free will one week, take up Calvinism the next week. They are led away by men who aren't hooked up with the Bible and hooked up with God. And some men really do lie in wait to deceive. Maybe it didn't start out that way. Maybe they started out sincere, 
but then they got a big following and they are scared to change their doctrine because they're scared of what people will think. So they will continuously deceive so they can defend their belief. And men are deceived by the slight of men. And there are false prophets who are quick to deceive and tr trick others through cunning craftiness. That is, they will take a truth from Scripture and then try to teach you a lie using a truth. For example, a Church of Christ preacher, I heard, would take the truth of the church in the Bible and trick you into thinking the Church of Christ cold is biblical. So he would give all kinds of truth about the Church of God in the Bible and lead you to believe that that's referring to the Church of Christ cult without even proving it. But neither give place to the devil in your vocation. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. If you give place to the devil in your vocation, then it will come out in your communication. When you're witnessing to others, when you're preaching and teaching, you have a mean and hateful and foul-mouthed spirit. And that stuff doesn't edify. You're helping no one when you cuss and talk about how much you hate another sinner. Uh, there are men who do that. And it doesn't edify Christians, and it doesn't get a lost person closer to coming to Jesus Christ. They already hate God, and they already hate you. They already hate your Bible. So now you're going to drive them even further away by saying you hate them. You don't want to overemphasize your hate or God's hate. Uh, the Bible does say that God hates workers of iniquity. But do you want to emphasize God's hate for something over God's love? The Bible also says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So do you want to overemphasize God's hate towards someone who already hates God and hates the Bible and hates you when you can tell them about the love of God? I'm not saying you're not supposed to tell them about God, God's hate for sin and how the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Don't be soft on sin. Don't tell everyone that they're a child of God when they're a child of the devil. I mean, if they're not saved, they're a child of hell, they're a child of disobedience, they're a child of the devil. But to just go up to them and say, God hates you, and think that's going to lead them to Jesus Christ, is just a little far-fetched. Uh, next, neither give place to the devil in your fellowship. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 says, I, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now look at those words and then think about the state of Christians today. Uh, lowliness, which is freedom from pride, having humility, meekness. If you're meek, then you're humble. You're submi you'll submit to the right authority without complaining and being lifted up in pride. The next word is long-suffering, which is the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, it means you'll put up with something for a long time. Forbearing one another in love, meaning you'll put up with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Uh, you want to keep all born-again believers together and not splitting up over petty things. And if you split up over compromise, then that's good, but... You want to try to stay together. And if you give place to the devil in your fellowship, then all of that stuff goes down the drain. If you give place to the devil in your fellowship with others, then you won't be meek and lowly. You'll start thinking you're better than everyone else because you know so much Bible. You'll be lifted up in pride. You'll start thinking you're better because you read more Bible, because you win more souls, because you shout more, because you give more, because you sacrifice more. And then pride comes in. And you can be doing everything right and living right and then give place to the devil and how, how you feel about yourself and what you're doing. 
Philippians 2, 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. A lot of people want the glory, and they will cause strife and contention with others to get that glory. On their way to the top to becoming the greatest, they'll run over every Christian they see. And if you let the devil in, you won't be long-suffering. You'll throw someone out of your fellowship or your friends list on Facebook because you can't handle them defying you or disagreeing with you. Uh, you don't know how to forbear in love because you end up being driven by hate and jealousy. If a brother messes up, then you should you see that as an opportunity to shoot him down, but you should see that as an opportunity to pick him back up and get him back on track. But yet you see that as an opportunity to get closer to becoming the greatest, so he, you kick him while he's down. And that's giving place to the devil in your fellowship. Matthew eleven twenty nine says Jesus Christ was meek and lowly. And he's also long-suffering towards us, we're not willing that any should perish. Jesus is long-suffering with us. And some of these guys say they are being just like Jesus when they show so much hate. And all they want to do is point out about the hate of God. And point out how Jesus was angry. And how he told people off and how he overthrew the tables of the money changers. And all that stuff's true. And we're supposed to talk about those things. And Jesus isn't soft like Hollywood says. But he's also not a jerk either. And they think they are preaching hard by overemphasizing the hate of God. But they are really just being smart alecks. And driving people further and further away from God. There's a time to talk about the hate of God and the wrath of God, and I talk about the wrath of God all the time on here. But for the most part, when you're witnessing to someone, you don't want to emphasize God's hate. I mean, you want to emph emphasize that they're a sinner, God hates sin, there's a penalty for sin, and they're going to go to hell if they don't get saved and get under the blood and get the, those sins covered by the blood. But you don't just want to just overemphasize God's hate so much to where you're acting like the Westboro Baptist Church or something. Ephesians 4.25 says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. You do realize that every time you run down a brother, that you are running down another member of the same body that you're in. There's one body, and you're in the same body as that person if you're both saved. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ is that body. And Colossians 1.18 shows us that Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church. So what that means is you aren't the head. If you think you're the head, then you're like Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence. But Ephesians 4.25 says, Speak every man truth with his neighbor. That's not hard. You want people to tell you the truth, so you should tell them the truth. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Jesus was angry, but he had a cause. He got angry at the religious Pharisees who blasphemed God. He got mad at the people making the Lord's house a den of thieves. He did overthrow the tables of the money changers. He did say, You serpent, ye generation of vipers, who shall deliver you from the damnation of hell? He did say all those things. And when he did that, he was angry without sinning. Uh, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't go to bed angry at your brothers and sisters in Christ because that lets the devil in. Ephesians 4.27 Neither give place to the devil. How do, you do, how do you let the devil in your fellowship? Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Gossiping in your fellowship is corrupt communication. It doesn't edify anybody. You do it because you want to look better than somebody else or because you're jealous or because you want to start drama with someone. But that lets the devil in more than anything else is your corrupt communication. Ephesians 4.31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, 
forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now most Christians today do the things in verse 31. They're bitter. They show their wrath and anger. They have a lot of clamor and evil speaking. And Ephesians 32 which says, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That's something that isn't practiced by many of them. And that destroys a lot of these fruit inspectors because they are looking for fruit in everybody, but they themselves can't obey these little commands like this in the Pauline epistles in Ephesians 4.32, to be kind to someone and tenderhearted. They're looking for fruit in others to prove the salvation of others. They say, well, I need to see fruit in him to see if he's really saved or not. But mostly they are looking for the sin in others, the sins that they don't commit themselves. But they themselves have a lot of anger. They have a lot of unforgiveness. They have a lot of bitterness and wrath towards other Christians. For this reason, they have a hard time in fellowship and end up not fellowshipping with anybody. They end up out in the woods somewhere because... They've been looking for fruit in others so much that they think that they're the only ones saved. But you're supposed to be kind one to another. And some preacher the other day was talking about people are too nice. I don't think that's the problem. I think people are too mean. People are jerks. They don't care about anybody. Iniquity abounds and the love of many wax cold. They don't care about anyone but themselves. They're all about strife and contention. Everyone is out for themselves. Ephesians 4.32 says, Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. If you don't forgive a brother who has gotten right and is trying to live right, then deep down you think you're better than Jesus Christ. And you've gave place to the devil. You're not meek and lowly. You don't esteem others better than yourself. You think you are first class and that they are second class because of some sin they may have done in their past. The Bible says, examine yourself, and not him and not her. Don't go around examining everyone. A lot of these guys go around examining everyone but themselves. They're going around digging up dirt on everyone but themselves. And if you spend more time in examining the sins of everyone else other than yourself then you'll end up in a mess. So neither give place to the devil in your fellowship. Love, be patient, and forgiving with the brothers and sisters in Christ. Next, neither give place to the devil in your doctrine. Ephesians is a book that people will use to try to prove their false doctrines. For example, look at verse 4 in chapter 4. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says, There is one body and one spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Notice it says one baptism. And the Church of Christ cult loves to come here and say things and try to get you to believe that the one baptism is water baptism. And every time they see the word baptism, they think of water while on the opposite extreme, some men will overly divide the Bible and they hate water baptism. And they will not have anything to do with Baptists or water baptism. And they say that the, the one baptism is the spirit baptism, which it is, but that doesn't mean you do away with believers' water baptism. Uh, the one baptism of Ephesians 4 is referring to the spirit baptism. And this baptism takes place the moment you're saved. has nothing to do with water. And you are baptized into the body of Jesus Christ without ever touching water. If you look at 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen, it says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. And that is the one baptism of Ephesians chapter 4. And it has absolutely nothing to do with water. But there are actually seven baptisms in the Bible. But only one of them saves a man. And 
That's this one spoken of in 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen. The moment you are born again, you are baptized into the body of Christ, and you can never get out. So why does it say one baptism in Ephesians if there are actually seven in the Bible? Because there is only one baptism that saves. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So it says one Lord, but the Bible also says God's many and Lord's many. It says one faith, but there's more than one faith. Uh, however, there is only one faith that saves, and that is faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one God that saves. However, there are many false gods. So the things in verses 4 through 5 are referring to the main things. It's referring to there's one baptism which saves. There's one true God, one true Lord of, Lord of Lords. There's many unclean spirits, but there's one spirit, the Holy Spirit. The only spirit that really matters. Uh, those who give place to the devil and their doctrine will get this all twisted. Ephesians 4, 7 through 9 says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? And this is referring to when Jesus Christ went into the lower parts of the earth, he went to hell and preached to the spirits in prison, according to 1 Peter 3.19, and he preached the gospel to the Old Testament saints who were also in the heart of the earth, waiting for his blood to be shed. And 1 Peter 4, 6 says, For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they may be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Before the resurrection, saints went to the heart of the earth. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And when Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, he took paradise with him. You know, when Jesus died that day, he went to the heart of the earth. And that's why he told the th thief, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Those who give place to the devil and their doctrine will ignore the truths on this matter. They will teach that every man went to the third heaven, even in the Old Testament, even though the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ hadn't even been shed yet. And by doing this, they also teach that Jesus Christ wasn't preaching the gospel when he went to the heart of the earth, but rather burning for three days and three nights. And the Bible definitely says Jesus went to hell, but it doesn't say that he burned in hell. Further proof Old Testament saints went to the heart of the earth is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, there was a great gulf fixed between Abraham and the rich man. Abraham was on the paradise side with Lazarus, while the rich man was on the torment side. And those who teach against this in the heart of the earth... They'll call this the Baptist Purgatory. But it's not Baptist Purgatory, it's actually Bible Doctrine. And they'll teach that Abraham's bosom is just a body part and not a place. And even if it is, paradise was still in the heart of the earth at one point. And you can see that clearly in the story in Luke 16. And just by remembering that no one ever got to the third heaven without the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ezekiel seems to speak of this in Ezekiel chapter 31. He seems to talk about paradise being in the heart of the earth. It says in Exodus 31, 16 through 18, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were his arm, that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. To whom art thou thus like in glory and greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth. Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that are slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and all his multitude, saith the Lord God. 
So you see that? Talks about the trees of Eden in the nether parts of the earth. All that drink water in the nether parts of the earth. Uh, those who teach against paradise being in the heart of the earth do so because they want to teach that Jesus burned in hell for three days and three nights and because they want to teach non-dispensationalism. They want you to believe that God has always dealt with man the exact same way and that they always went to the same place when they died. But how could they go to the third heaven if Jesus Christ hadn't even shed his blood yet? Uh, Ephesians 4.10 says, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth and then rose from the dead. And it says in 11 and 12, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Your pastors and teachers are gifts from Jesus Christ that he gave to the church. These are the gifts that he gave to men. Ephesians 4.14, That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cutting crafty, craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. A lot of these men who have a lot of pride deceive you into believing something just because it is new and exciting. To start a new movement. Uh, to start a new movement, you have to have a new doctrine sometimes. And that is why they try so hard to go against the grain. They want to start a new great movement and be the next Sammy Allen, the next Jack Howells, the next Peter Ruckman. They want to be the greatest. And to start their new movement, many times they'll have a gimmick or some type of pet doctrine that they'll hammer on over and over again and deceive people and get people away from the right doctrine and over to their side. Uh, but don't be tossed to and fro by their doctrine. If you give place to the devil in your doctrine, then you also violate Ephesians 4.29, which says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. If you're teaching heresies because you gave place to the devil in your doctrine, then that's corrupt communication that you're putting out. If you have pride, jealousy, deception, motive for self in your heart, then you may end up teaching something false to make yourself look better or sound smarter. And the Bible says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The Bible says concerning false prophets that you know them by their fruits. But the Bible also talks about the fruit of your lips. So pay, pay close attention to what the man says because they can mix truth with error to deceive. And next, neither give place to the devil in your walk. We talked about walk at the beginning of this, but let's go into more into it. Ephesians 4.17 says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. You have a standing and you have a state. Your standing is that you are sinlessly perfect in Christ. Your state is how your Christian walk is at any given moment. Are you walking with God or are you running from God? The Bible says Enoch walked with God. Can you really say you walk with God? Would Jesus Christ go where you go? Watch the things that you watch, hang out with the people that you hang out with? Paul says walk not as other Gentiles walk. And this shows a racial, racial distinction is still there for those who are in Christ. And this would be referring to physically because spiritually, Spiritually speaking, if you've been born again, then you're neither Jew nor Gentile. But Paul shows here there's still physically a racial distinction. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18 says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. People have blind hearts. Satan blinds minds. There are blind guides who are blind leaders of the blind. And one of the characteristics of the Laodicean church in Revelation 3.17 is that they are blind. If your walk is with God, then you can see. 
just like the Lord went before the children of Israel as a pillar of fire by night. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have to walk with Jesus Christ and then you won't be blinded to the things of this world and be deceived. Ephesians 4.19 says, who, have been, who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. You can get to a point of being past feeling. The Bible talks about having your conscience seared with a hot iron. And when you give yourself over to lasciviousness, then you're giving yourself over to extreme sex perversion. Some people have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. In Romans 1, it talks about those who give themselves over to fornication. Some sins are so deadly that you think you have a hold of them, but they actually have a hold of you because you've given yourself over to them. And at this point, you, you could be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And Ephesians 4.20 says, But ye have not so learned Christ. Uh, Matthew 11.29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. To learn Christ, you have to walk with him. In Luke 10, 39, it says, And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. She sat at Jesus Christ's feet and heard his word. Learn about Jesus Christ by reading the Gospels. Learn about Jesus Christ by reading the Gospels through over and over again. Uh, read the book of Revelation. Learn things about Jesus Christ there. Read the Pauline epistles. Those are also the words of Jesus Christ. I mean, the whole Bible points you to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's all t kinds of types and pictures of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. He is the Word. If you want to walk and talk with Jesus Christ, then open the book. You'll be sitting at Jesus' feet. Ephesians 4.21 says, If so be that ye have heard Him and have been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus. You know, the best way to get taught and the most sure way to be taught is by comparing Scripture with Scripture. That is how you can know for certain what is right and how you can literally be taught by Jesus Christ. God uses men to teach you, but if you want to know men, if you want to know if men are teaching right, then you must study the book for yourself. The truth is in Jesus, and the truth is in this book. Jesus is pure, the book is pure, but the Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. You don't know what I'm saying is right unless you look it up in the Bible. I don't believe that any man is 100% right. I'm not 100% right. Your pastor's not 100% right. Your favorite teacher's not 100% right. But the Bible is without error. It's 100% correct. And it will never lead you the wrong way. Unless you're coming to it with bad motives. And then if you mess with the book then God will mesh with your mind, as they say. Ephesians 4.22 says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Your conversation is not, the only, is not only the way you talk, but also has to do with your everyday walk. And what it means by putting off the old man is basically don't act like you acted before you were saved. It is impossible for a Christian to act just like a lost person. Or, uh, excuse me, it is possible for a Christian to act just like a lost person. It is possible for a lost person to counterfeit the life of a saved person. And that is why I don't base someone's salvation on outward evidence. But you need to put off the old man. Don't let your walk be like it was before you were saved. You were corrupt. You are involved in corrupt communication, and evil communications corrupt good manners. And you are on the giving and receiving end of co corrupt communication. But put off these things. Ephesians 4.23 says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Once you were born again, Jesus Christ moved in. You were no longer a child of disobedience, but a new creature. You got the new birth. 
and you need to set your affections on New Jerusalem. There is no new thing under the sun, but you can find something new that you never saw before every time you open the book. You were made new at salvation. And if you want to renew your Christian walk, then walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning let the things you do be what He wants you to do. Quit doing the things you did before you were saved. Ephesians 4.24 says, And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The new man is that new creature inside you. It is who you really are. The Lord Jesus Christ now lives inside you if you're saved, and there is a battle going on between the old man and the new man. The new man wants to sing hymns. The old man likes rock and rap and country and techno. The old man likes wicked Hollywood movies. The new man likes to read the Bible. And each one pulls you a certain way. You're in a, a battle. You're at war with the flesh. The flesh wants to do this. The new man wants to do that. And here are some rules on how to walk. Ephesians 4.28 says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. If you labor and work with your hands, then you'll have no need to steal, and you'll be able to give to those who need something. Paul says more than once to work with your hands. Do something that keeps you busy. Paul talks about those who work not at all but are busybodies. If you go to work and work 40 hours, then it will help your Christian walk. You don't need abundance of idleness. Uh, that is when you get in trouble and that is one of the sins of Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now we are back on this verse yet again. And if you have your walk right, then you'll have your talk right. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If you walk with Jesus Christ, then you're going to start talking like him. Uh, my pastor always says, walk right, talk right, spit white. And if you're walking with Jesus Christ, then you're going to talk right. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your body, and your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He lives in you. The Bible talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's a mystery. If you're sealed into the day of redemption, then you can't lose your salvation. The Old Testament saints would get the Holy Spirit, but they weren't, weren't sealed like we are. You're sealed into the day of redemption. Referring to the redemption of your body, which is the only thing yet to be redeemed. In, in Romans 8.23, it says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. But this has been Ephesians chapter 4 on the subject of neither give place to the devil.